Good morning, my good, good friends. The 1990s are upon us again, bringing with them their usual mix of glamour and dross. Let's see who triumphs and who irritates us as we explore the week ending May 27th, 1990. Number 10 is, as mentioned many times before on this channel, one of my favourite live acts ever, Adelaide's Mighty Angels, with their second to last top 40 single and only the third top 10 single they had in a long career. The glam, metally, dogs are talking. The album it came from, Beyond Salvation, was the only number one of their nine top 20 albums. But from pretty much the next album on, it was a hash of lawsuits, lost members and death, and that was the band's legacy. While the touring act is now stable and legitimately based on former members, with one of Australia's most experienced vocals up replacing the sadly deceased Doc Neeson, they lack somehow the magnificent intensity of the old angels. At number 9 is the band which kind of silently ruled the early 90s, Roxette with Dangerous. Roxette had a dozen top 20 hits and three number ones and a number two. A slick, reliable Swedish hit machine, Roxette knew all the hooks to get themselves on the radio and were a steady and not unpleasant alternative to grunge. At number eight is the first but not the last mention this week for Michael Bolton. The ultimate journeyman singer, Bolton would sing anything that sold and usually managed to sell it. His huge, bombastic voice, total lack of emotional intelligence and ludicrous mullet made him the perfect excuse for what was a serious rock singer in 1990. Since his big 1993 hit, Said I Loved You But I Lied, he has slithered down the industry totem pole, recording one-off projects for increasingly fly-by-night labels, hear one album, there the next, making him the ultimate Bolton Wanderer. Number seven was the briefly popular Scottish combo Wet Wet Wet, who had a couple of soggy Scott soft rock hits at the end of the decade, this time with their biggest hit, Sweet Surrender. It's a pleasant enough song, radio fodder and no better. The only thing I really remember about our over moist subjects here is that I can never tell them apart from Delamitri, a rather drier band from the same parts as WWW. Six is the Go-Go's Go-Girl, Belinda Carlisle, who, try as she might and deserve as she did, never made the breakthrough to Madonna-level stardom. Another curiosity about Carlisle is that I don't think anyone has ever had so many greatest hits packages put out for so few hit singles. Her singles were good, no doubt, and they just dried up after 1993. Summer Rain is nice enough, it's no Leave a Light On or Live Your Life Be Free, and it's certainly one of the best things on the chart this week, but one just feels that her talent and personality deserved more. Five. Oh look, it's Michael Bolton again, with the somewhat better How Can We Be Lovers. Did I mention that he had to pay the Isley Brothers five million dollars for ripping off one of their songs? There. Harmless pop from Paula Abdul at four with Opposites Attract. They really thought this was where pop was going in 1990. Korg M1s crashing and clattering with mad abandon over a generic rent-a-snap basis and a cute girl writhing in a colourful video. On the whole, that doesn't seem like a bad idea, especially with the toothsome Paula. I have to say, but I can't remember this in the slightest and listening to it jogged just the most vaporous of memories. It's odd, it might just be about this point where Mr. Job and Mortgage and Disposable Income started to drift to a more bourgeoisie experience of music played on these newfangled CD players rather than the celebration of disposability that pop radio was back then. Who knows, if I had a soul I might contemplate these things in the dark nights of it. But I traded myself one of those newfangled CD thingies in 1990 or so. Number three is trifling rubbish from the guy from Neighbours who definitely wasn't squiring Miss Kylie Minogue about town. That was Jason Donovan, who had his own line of trifling rubbish. Mona was an attempt to make Craig McLaughlin the next breakout star from the TV show. It didn't. It reduced him to a byword for ridiculous Disney-type tie-in music careers here in Australia. What did make McLaughlin in the end a breakout star was hard work and risk-taking, which makes it sad to see his current plight as victim of a baseless hashtag MeToo witch hunt all the sadder. But as for this record, Binnett. 
a Bo Diddley cover. It's not the worst song on the top 10 this week, but it isn't better than Michael Bolton. At number two is, surprise, surprise, the worst song on the charts this week. It's the previously pilloried All I Want to Do Is Make Love To You by a band that should have known better, Heart. I'm all out of pithy zingers for this kind of piffle, so submit your own below. One of the central dichotomies of man is that facts don't care for feelings, yet we expect them to carry out both the same role. I'm not, however, bothered by this kind of psychobabble when the facts are simply as fun as the following. Biggest rise of this week up 37 to 13 was the once next big things to be, the Stone Roses with Fool's Gold. Possibly the most overhyped band ever. They scuppered their career by getting wrapped up in legal issues, taking forever to make a second album, allowing all of the Britpop movement to pass them by, threw out a killer lead single for the second album in Love Spreads, and then the album was very... Ugh. And they broke up within a year. They got back together later on again, but did bugger all but tour to the ageing Disco Biscuit crowd. They should have realised this was never to be when John Squire, their excellent guitarist who left in 1994, called his first solo band the Seahorses, which is an anagram for He Hates Roses. 13 was as high as Fool's Gold got, and it immediately sunk back down the charts to be gone six weeks later. The song which was mercifully already going on with the business of vanishing from the charts this week was Midnight Oil and their rubbishy We'd be so much happier if we were communists screed Blue Sky Mine down 13 to 34. Biggest debutante this week was Tina Arena struggling to transition from child star to all grown up songstress with her frankly ridiculous I Need Your Body. Sold like hotcakes but then it'd be a long time before she was back on the charts although next time she'd have found her groove nicely. Longest last year on the chart was, unbelievably, after six months, Girl I'm Gonna Miss You, still comfortably ensconced at number 37, by Millie Vanilli. This just goes from bad to worse. Number one in the USA was the quintessential all-American girl Madonna, with what would have been her last great single for a long time in Vogue. Anyway, she's Madonna. She's the boss. Over in England, Killer by Adamski was in the middle of a four-week run on top, having taken over from Vogue at number one that week. Number one album for the gadabouts about town was Michael Bolton's Soul Provider. I've never heard it, and frankly, the mere thought of the horrors it may contain keeps me awake at night. You know Vogue was number one in the US. Had done a month there in England, and it did sell six million copies to become the number one single worldwide for 1990. But something tells me Monty the Safety Monkey is going to drum us in a surprise at number one. Beat it for the people, Monty. Nope, no surprise whatsoever. In its third week at number one, having gone 19 2 1, 1, 1 with another week to come, it's Vogue. As I've said before of this record, it ends not only the 1980s, as sooner rather than later the personality free club music would take over, which helped the record industry because every act in that music was disposable and fungible as trends, technology and tastes changed, and the mopey dopey grunge acts, which were supposed to be bringing back the rebel spirit of rock and roll. The only thing they brought back were Joe Strummer's caustic observations from Garage Land a dozen years previously. MTV began its insidious and invidious decline in 1992 when it began screening reality shows. Nope. In the wider sense, Vogue seems like the beginning of a sudden and precipitous ending. It seems to be like a demarker between the old classic canon and the new corporate pop and the shock that was to follow it very shortly thereafter as disruptive technologies remove the entire structure of the industry as we long-time observers knew it and replaced it with ultimately what we have today where through streaming everything is your own personal top 40 50 100 or 10,000 and there we have it folks a week for such up and down music what strange philosophy it did engender Monty and I would like to thank you for your indulgences this week, and I am sure we will at some time be able to add Michael Bolton's lawyers to our list of avid viewers. And we, all of us, would dearly love to see you next time on our journey to the foggiest of foreign countries, the past.